God, we're thankful that you're a God that's working in our lives. Your God is moving things into place, changing situations, making a way in the wilderness, a river in the desert, providing in each and every area for us. Not because of who we are, but because of who you are. Because of your goodness, your mercy, your glory, for your name's sake. Oh, God. God, we love you. Yes. Jesus. Jesus. God, we are thankful to be gathered in your house this morning. Thankful to be here knowing that you are still God. No matter what happens in our lives, no matter what situation we face, you stay faithful. You stay true to your word. You are who you say you are. You are everything we need and everything we will ever need in our lives. God, we thank you for the privilege of sharing from your word this morning and getting a fresh revelation of your love and who Jesus is in our lives. Jesus, you are the name above every other name. In your name, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that you are God. Holy Spirit, welcome in our midst. Thank you for working in our lives and changing our hearts and turning our hearts to the Father. We glorify you this morning in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen. and amen. I'm going to be honest with you. We didn't think that worshipping from the videos will have the same effect that it had these past three weeks. And I'm so thankful for you as a family. You're just here to glorify God's name. You're not here for any other reason. You're not here for anyone. You're here for God. And it's so beautiful and it's a privilege to glorify God's name with you. Today we are at part three and the final part of our exponential series. Um, I'm honest, I didn't think we we're going to get to part three. I thought maybe at part two we will stop, but we got to part three. And just a bit of a, bit of a recap. In the first week, we realized that God's promises stay true. We might not see the promises in our lives immediately, but God is working in the foundation of our lives so the moment that we step into that promise, that promise is sustainable. It never fails in our lives. And, and we realize that God is this creator. He creates this masterpiece of a life for us. And he sent Jesus to, to us as the conductor showing us the way to go. And all we need to do is just be part of the orchestra and just follow the conductor. Just follow what Jesus is doing. Just follow his lead. And then we realize that sometimes we get a solo. We get a time to shine. But we should not be so focused on our solo that we miss what the conductor is doing. We should always remember that my gift, what God has given for me, is not for me. It's to edify the body. Your gift is never for yourself. Your gift is to edify the body. The talent that, you, that God gave you is not so that you can look good. It's so that the vine can look good. And it's so beautiful to know that no matter what we face, God still has an exponential plan for your life. A plan for something to grow extremely, abundantly, above what you can dream or think. This morning, I want to start with a question. So, it's a hypothetical question. Okay, before we get to the question, then let me jump ahead. Those that are 
mechanical inclined. That's not me. I'm honest. But you would know what a lever is. Am I right? And you will know what leverage is. Okay. Now, the law of a leverage is the greater the input force, the greater the output force. Okay. Now, I always remember when <laughs> you struggle to get something loose, you put it in a vise, and you take a bigger pipe, and you attach it to it, and then you pull at the end of the pipe, and magically that thing gets loose. It doesn't get loose when you pull it here, but when you pull it here, it causes leverage, so that it gets loose. Now, in our lives, there's always leverage. And nothing more than two letters. And it's I and F, if. A greatest leverage in our lives are the word, is the word, if. Think about that word for a second. A small word with a big impact. It defines our greatest regrets, if only. It defies impossible circumstances, as if this would happen in my life. But it also has infinite possibilities. What if? So if, if can make a big change in your life. And the scripture, I always, <coughs> might sound weird to say it like this, but I sometimes read a story in the Bible and I think, what if this happened? What would be the outcome? And now I want you just to, to, to journey with me on this train of thought. So what if Moses ignored the burning bush? What if that small pebble missed Goliath's head? What if Esther didn't risk it all to go before the king? What if Joseph and Mary did not listen to the angel's warning and fled to Egypt? What if? Let's make it personal. What, what if do you have in your life? That can make you think. And while I was preparing this, I, I, I went through a, a couple of things and I asked myself a couple of what if questions. What if we never moved to Polokwane? What if I never went into ministry? And a very personal thing. What if I never gathered the courage? You guys know I'm a very shy person. Okay? I'm not a very outgoing person. So what if I never gathered the courage to tell my wife when she stepped into a small group, you sit next to me. <laughs> and I thought to myself, what if? My life would be completely different. And we always sit with these what if questions in our lives. Now I want to ask you a big one and I want you to think with me. What if today you got the opportunity to go 10 years back in time with the knowledge you have today? Or stay where you are now with a million rand. What would you do? Think about it for a second. What if you could go back 10 years with the knowledge you have today of everything you went through this last decade? So you can change everything in your life for this last decade. Or go on with a million bucks in the bank. Think to me, with me, what would you change in your life? What would you do different? 
Or would you go on with your life as it is now? You see, I asked myself that same question and I realized one thing. That all my decisions in my life, good and bad, has led me to the point where I am today. Every decision that I have made in my life has led to this moment. And yes, we sit with a, a couple of what if questions and I ask you again, what would you do different if you can go back 10 years? And I want to ask a counter question to that. Why don't you do that today? Why don't you start now with what you would have done different 10 years ago? You see, what if you're one decision away from living the exponential life that God has planned for you? See, at the end of your life, your greatest regret won't be the things you did, but rather the things you wish you hadn't. Your greatest regret will be the things you didn't do, but wish you did. You see, it's those what-if dreams that we never act upon that turn into regrets in our lives. See, potential is God's gift to us, but making the most of that potential is our gift back to God. See, anything less than a result will lead to regret. I want to ask you this morning, what if you decide to risk it all and trust God? What if you decide to get out of your comfort zone and follow God's plan for your life? What if? You see... There's one chapter in the Bible that's a very powerful chapter for us as believers. And that's Romans 8. When last have you read Romans 8? I mean, Romans 8 starts off with the following words. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And it ends with this beautiful words for, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. <laughs> Listen, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate me from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Nothing in this whole world can separate you from the love that God has for you. And in the middle of Romans 8, as if that wasn't enough, in verse 28 we find that, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. And then in verse 7, 37 it says, Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. And then there, slap, bam, in the middle, verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If, those words again, if, God is for us. Who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? I mean, this chapter is powerful. Yet, there is something that stops us from believing that this chapter is true for my life. And that... The thing that stops you is fear. You see, it's those negative what-if questions 
that the enemy raises in our mind. What if I heard wrong? What if this is not God's plan for me? What if I embarrass myself? More, what if I fail? You see, the problem is we start believing these questions. We start believing these lies. And then we are like those Israelites in the desert, wanting to rather go back to Egypt because things were comfortable there. There was enough food there. We would rather go back to our comfort zone where things were easier. Yet we forgot that we were in bondage there. In Egypt, they were slaves. Yet they'd rather go back there because things are easier. You see, the enemy doesn't come to us with a chain and says, yeah, this is what I have planned for your life. I want you to live a life of bondage, a life of fear, a life in change, a life of addiction, a life that I have something in store for you will destroy your marriage, destroy your family, destroy everything you have. I mean, no man will fall for this. I mean, I mean we are not that dumb. I mean, come on. But you see, the enemy comes and he says, let me just give you a link. Let me give you a choice. Let me ask you a question. And it's the same thing he did with Adam and Eve. And he says, did God really say that to you? Did God really promise you those things? You see, then that chain starts forming in our lives and forming and forming until we find ourselves in a position where we are in bondage. And then the worst part, <laughs> it gives you that final choice and before you know it, You are stuck. You are stuck. Not stuck completely, I see. <laughs> I don't want to be stuck today, I see. You are stuck. Let me just sort this out. Stuck in the life of bondage. You see, the enemy comes and he reminds us of our mistakes, what we did wrong, he reminds us of those fears, those failures. The challenge the Israelites faced is it is approximately 600 kilometers from Egypt into the Promised Land. That should not take 40 years. That journey, if you work out roughly about 10 kilometers an hour walking, five kilometers for some people, let's say five, it'll take you about a couple of days to travel that distance. Yet, it took the Israelites six, uh, 40 years to travel 600 kilometers. You know the reason for that? It took God 40 years to get Egypt out of them. It took God 40 years to remind them that that is not who you are. You are not meant to live a life of bondage. You are not meant to live a life in chains. This is what I have planned for your life. It took him 40 years to get Egypt out of them. You see, sometimes it takes me a while to let go of things in my life. It takes a while for me to let go of the past. Let go of my mistakes. Let go of my regrets. 
those what-if questions, so that I can enter God's promise for my life. And then, you see, we read Romans 8 that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. If God is for me, nothing can be against me. Yet, we say, that sounds beautiful. That sounds awesome. But I don't believe that's true for my life, because look at this. Look where I am. Because, you see, I have this. And most of it is because of choices I made. Sometimes where I failed, where I fell. And I believe that this is what is in store for my life. I mean, I can still write, still work on my phone. Yeah, I can still drive, so I'm fine. I mean, I'll, I'll be fine if these change. But you see, <coughs> if you are in Christ, you are no longer defined by what you did wrong in your life. You are defined by what Christ did right. I'm going to say that again. If you are in Christ, you are no longer defined by what you did wrong in your life. You are defined by what Christ did for you. You see, then Jesus comes. And I'm going to ask Jesus to, to come. Hopefully he knows the combination. <laughs> You see, he comes, and I'm so thankful for, for Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> and he comes and he... Um, need light. <laughs> and he, he says, but this is not what I have planned for your life. And this, yeah, though it might take a time, but trust me in this. Trust me in the process that I'm busy with in your life. Because... Your bondage, your change, is not what is meant for your life. I have more in store for you. And then Jesus comes and He comes and He nails my past, He nails my regret, He nails my chain upon a cross. And He doesn't stop there. You see, because Romans 8 says we are more than conquerors. The moment he rose from the grave, he took the key to release you from any chain, any bondage that the enemy has planned for your life. You see, now I can say freely that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. That nothing in the whole world can separate me from the love of God. And as God is for me, who can be against me? If God is for me, who can be against me? I want you to work with me here. If God is for me, who can be against me? If God is for me, so I'm going to say something, and I want you to reply with who? Sickness, poverty, fear, depression, negative thoughts, bondage. If God is for me, who can be against me? You see, I want you to stand with me. Stand with me, please. I want you to realize something. If God is for you, and we believe God is for us, who can be against you? I want you to close your eyes just for a moment, and I'm not going to put anybody on the spot or anything, but I want you to close your eyes, and I want to ask you, what if you allowed God to leverage those fears 
into something he can use for his glory. You might be standing here today and you might ask yourselves, why am I going through this? Why am I facing these challenges for my life? God, you say you have an exponential plan for my life, but why can't I get past this moment? I know the plans you have for me are good and plans to prosper, but it feels like I'm in bondage. Why does it feel like this? I want you to tell you this morning, God is going to show up and he's going to show you what he can do in this situation. You see the same thing that the enemy sharpened to kill you while you were chained up in his bondage. It's the same thing God is going to use to save you. I'm going to say that again. The same thing, the same weapon that the enemy has formed to take you out. To destroy you. To leave you flat on the floor in a hopeless situation. It's the same weapon God is going to use in your life to restore you. To save you. You see, right now you are standing. And I want you to prophetically do something with me. I just want you to take a step. And say, God, I'm stepping into your promises for my life. I'm stepping in what you have planned for my life. I'm standing on your word. I'm standing on who you are. I'm standing on every word you've spoken over my life. If you say you will make a way in the wilderness, I stand upon that. If you say you'll make rivers in the desert, I'll stand upon that. If you say even though I go through the fire, I will not be burned, I stand upon that. If you say the waters will come, but it will not overflow me, I'll stand upon that. I stand on every promise that you have given me. I will not believe the lies of the enemy for my life because I stand on your word Amen. and while you are standing on this word and while you are standing on his word I want you to raise your hands see now you are in the perfect position to glorify God's name now you are in the perfect position to give him praise now I want you to start praying I want you to start glorifying